Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. <clears throat> Today I'm gonna to be giving a presentation that I put together and I've given a couple times live. It's something that is, is very important to me and it's about the way the body works with exercise and how we use energy. So I hope you enjoy this presentation. If you have any ideas for future presentations or topics that you'd like to hear, I'm happy to cover those. So please leave a comment or shoot me a message and let's get going. So let's, let's check out this presentation and I hope you enjoy everybody. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. Today's presentation is titled Appropriate Exercise Selection for Performance. Basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna understand the way the body works, particularly when it comes to exercise, so we can remain engaged in our workouts. So let's jump into what, our, what the itinerary looks like. First, we're gonna go over the history of exercise. Then we're gonna go over the evidence-based benefits of exercise. Now these are pretty well known at this point, so we won't spend a lot of time here, but what we will talk about more is the body's energy systems. Then we'll talk about training the body, what it looks like and how to use those energy systems. We'll have a brief introduction of goal setting, and then we'll determine an appropriate training strategy based on our goals. Okay, so I want you to take this time, pause the video, and write down what does fitness mean to you, and we'll do that by writing down three fitness goals that you might have. So once you've got those written down, we're gonna move on. And we're gonna talk really quickly about who am I, I'm way down here in the corner. But a better question is, why should you care? You're taking the time to watch this video and hopefully learn a thing or two, so I should introduce myself. So my name is Sean Walsh. I grew up in Freehold Township, New Jersey. I was a track and field athlete coming out of high school, and I was lucky enough to continue on to college and compete at the University of Connecticut. When I was at UConn, I competed in the decathlon. And for those of you unfamiliar with track, the decathlon is 10 different events. It's a series of running, jumping, and throwing events that scored over two days. And track and field in general, the difference between winning and losing is fractions of an inch, fractions of a second, etc. So in order to get the most out of your training, you need to learn how to maximize your performance um, through your training. And that's really what gauged my interest into exercise and performance. So after I finished up my eligibility at the University of Connecticut, I continued on to graduate school where I got my doctorate in physical therapy. So from here, I got a job right out of college for select physical therapy, where I had a local contract with a, a high school, and it was a great experience. I met a lot of athletes, and I had fun uh, helping them perform the way that I performed in college. Once I moved on from that job, I had the opportunity to work for TB12, which TB12 was Tom Brady's performance center, and I worked for his center in Foxborough, in Boston, and then I moved down to Tampa to help open up the Tampa location. And we were lucky enough to help the Buccaneers win the Super Bowl that year, and it was an awesome experience. And once I finished up at TB12, I decided, hey, it's time for me to do things on my own. I started Walsh Performance and Training, and that's what I still do today. Uh, I'm a physical therapist that works on the performance side uh, with my athletes and just with general people looking to get better. Okay, so to wrap things up, I have my doctorate in physical therapy. I'm also a certified strength and conditioning specialist. And if none of that impresses you, I can juggle. So hopefully you have a little bit about my background, you understand where I'm coming from, and we'll move on. <clears throat> so the history of exercise, we're going to start with talking about the different time periods we'll talk about. The prehistoric times, that will move us into athletic competitions, wartime, the enlightenment period, the industrial revolution, and then that will take us to present day. So let's kick things off talking about prehistoric times. So in these time frames, exercise was a part of daily life. We needed exercise to survive. It was, it's how we did things as a species. It was a series of running, walking, climbing, carrying. So the lifestyle, it forced the necessity of physical fitness. If you weren't physically fit, you were going to have a pretty hard time uh, contributing and staying involved in this type of a society. From here, once we started to get things going in terms of how we worked as a society, competitions arose. So we started to notice, hey, you're pretty good at shooting that arrow. Let's see how good you really are. Or you're pretty fast, but I think I'm faster. So in cultures like Egypt, we found wrestling, swimming, and archery start to develop. In ancient Greek times, uh, the Olympics running and the marathon began to take off. And then in China, we had martial arts, things like Tai Chi. So exercise displayed cultural pride. Okay, this is one thing that our cultures could say, hey, we've got these people that are really good at this or within cultures, hey, so-and-so from this tribe or this area 
is better at running or, or shooting an arrow than you are. Okay? Uh, along with the competitions, we started to find that cultures were conflicting. So wartime demanded exercise. All right? We noticed that when we trained for war, we did better. Go figure. So military training began to, began to be a cornerstone in a lot of societies. We saw it in the ancient Romans and the ancient Spartans. Um, where training for battle became important. And, you know, if you've seen the movie 300, you know the rigorous um, benchmarks that it took to even fight in war in general. So this came in the, in the form of physical training, strength training, and then even combat training. So the preparation for battle became important. So between the conflicting cultures and the um, competitions that came around, we started to build on something called exercise capacity. Okay, this is a new term, but it's not a new idea. So exercise capacity is essentially the amount of physical exertion required to complete a task. Okay, it's your minimum buy-in to be able to do what you want to do. So some examples in the ancient times were hunting, performing hand-to-hand -hand combat, even throwing a discus. So you have to train to a certain level to be able to do it in general. And more present day examples would be to run a marathon, to lift a child, or even to stand up from a chair, right? These are all things that they do require a minimum amount of exertion in order to do them in general, okay? So let's move on to back to the history. So now we get to the Renaissance and the Enlightenment period, the 14th and 18th century. And this is one of the major milestones that we've reached as a culture in terms of exercise. This is where educators, philosophers, and scientists really started to take a look into uh, what our bodies did. Uh, when we were exercising. So we noticed that not only did it have physiological benefits in terms of uh, what are we doing and, and how are we building that exercise capacity, but more the psychological uh, benefits. So we developed character, discipline, and wellness. So if any of you have been lucky to go to, to Rome and walk the Vatican, the Vatican takes you through history through art. The artists usually were just painting what was relevant at the times. And if you see right here, this is a painting by Raphael. It's the School of Athens. And they're all the, at the time, the present day uh, philosophers, scientists, even a few artists. But you can tell one thing that most people are pretty physically fit. You know, these guys almost look like they're getting ready for a Mr. Olympia competition. So the art just goes to show what was important at the time. And in this time, the, these people started to take interest in physical fitness, uh, aside from the necessary physical uh, demands that physical fitness demanded. All right, so then we get to the Industrial Revolution, and this is one of the times that we took a left-hand uh, turn as a society. So now our workforce was pretty sedentary. Um, we had you know, things like the cotton gym and the printing press where Things were could be run, but you needed people running them, so we, we became more, more sedentary as a society. So our workforce changed, which means also our lifestyle changed as a result. Now, we did understand that this uh, was going to raise some concerns for physical fitness and health status. The problem was, how do we address it? And some of it was through the education of youth, through physical education and sports. Um, but it was one of those things that physical fitness kind of became out of sight and out of mind. But because there was an idea behind, hey, we're not moving a lot, we need to do something about this, we developed a lot of disciplines of study around exercise. So that brings us to present day. So disciplines of study uh, include kinesiology, sports medicine, I'm a physical therapist, there's plenty more that are, are not listed there. <clears throat> but then there's also plenty of fitness options. You know, if you live in a, um, in a pretty populous area, if you go by any strip mall or, or any populated area, you're going to find gyms, yoga studios, group training. Um, these options are all available, right? So we understand as a society that these things are important. But what I want to talk about is how to utilize some of these, uh, some of these systems to our advantage. So here are some current benefits of exercise. We're going to breeze right through these because all of these should be reviewed to you. So there's cardiovascular fitness, there's weight management, increased muscle strength and tone, enhanced flexibility and mobility, improved bone mineral density, enhanced mental health, increased energy levels, reduced chronic uh, disease risk, improved cognitive function, and a longer lifespan, right? We shouldn't look at any of these and say, wow, I've never heard that before. So this is all the, the end goals of exercises. What I want to teach you is how to achieve these and how to do it best based around your goals. So... 
here comes some science. There's, we're going to talk about some, some scientific uh, things and, and the way our body works, but I'm going to make sure that you have a good understanding of this as we go. So this is more or less a college level presentation, but once again, you're going to come away with a good understanding because I'm going to take my time explaining these things and make sure you know what, what's going on. If you do have any questions, drop them in the comments and I'll address them. So we're going to start with the body's basic unit of energy. Okay, that's ATP. Now, ATP, we can just think about as one unit of energy in the body. The name uh, is adenosine triphosphate, but the name is not too important. What is a good takeaway about ATP is the TP, which stands for triphosphate. As we use the energy, we lose a phosphate group, and now ATP becomes ADP, adenosine diphosphate. We've lost one phosphate group. So the creation of ATP comes in multiple forms based on our body's demand, okay? We don't just have free-flowing ATP throughout our body. It would be nice if we did, but we don't. We have it stored in certain ways, but there are ways that we can access it and use it. It's kind of like gasoline. We don't just have an unlimited supply of gasoline in our car. We have to go to the gas station and fill up. So there are ways that we're going to, quote unquote, fill our quotas of, of ATP. And that's what we're going to talk about right now, because we do that in several different ways. So the body's energy systems with exercise, the way that we produce ATP, we have three main systems of producing ATP in our body. So this is the energy system along with the energy production rate. So first off is the phosphagen system. Now you're gonna see all of these three systems throughout the, uh, the PowerPoint and they're color coded. The phosphagen system is fast. You think about a green light, you're stepping on the gas there. It's also known as the creatine phosphate cycle. And I know a lot of people have heard of creatine before. Throughout this presentation, I'll explain to you where creatine can be useful. Then there's the anaerobic glycolysis system. Okay, this is the medium production of energy. So uh, the word anaerobic is, uh, or the word aerobic is oxygen. So in science, when we put an in front of things, anaerobic, it means without, so without oxygen. And this is also known as the lactic acid system. This is more of our medium production of energy. And then we have our aerobic system. And I think a lot of people have heard of this before. This is a slower production of energy. Okay, so seeing these listed may not be too clear. So on the next slide, we're gonna have these listed out in a spectrum. So on the far left over there, we have the low intensity, uh, and that's our aerobic system. And then as we move on and get more intense, we move on along to the anaerobic glycolysis. And then finally, we finish off with a phosphagen system, which is our high intensity, okay? These are the three systems, and, and this is not drawn to scale. But this is just an example of what it looks like with them written out uh, on a spectrum. So we're going to talk about each one of these specifically, and we'll start with the phosphagen or the fast production of energy. Okay, this is also known as the creatine phosphate system. This is for short bursts of high energy production. When I say short burst, uh, we only have about eight to 10 seconds that we can utilize the system. Then there's no more available for us to use anymore. So no oxygen is required in this system as well. So therefore it's also anaerobic, which just means without oxygen. And the recovery of this system takes about three to five minutes. Okay, so that eight to 10 seconds, that's what we have available to use. But the recovery, so we finish up, uh, we, we exhaust that eight to 10 seconds. We need another three to five minutes to recover until we can tap into that full eight to 10 seconds. So some examples are short sprints, heavy lifting and jumping. Okay, let's move on and talk about the next system, which is the anaerobic glycolysis or also the lactic acid system. This is a medium production of energy. So this is what happens when we take our body's glycogen and convert it to glucose to create ATP. So let's pause real quick and explain that to you. Glucose is our body's sugar. It's kind of the basic form of carbohydrate that we have available in our body. Glycogen is stored glucose, okay? We have two molecules of glucose, they go together and they get stored. A good analogy for this is if we go to the grocery store, and we get a bunch of chicken, we're not gonna use it all, we put the chicken in the freezer, okay? That's kind of the same thing that we have with glucose and glycogen. The glycogen is just stored glucose. So anaerobic glycolysis, anytime we see that lysis, we're breaking it apart anaerobic without oxygen glycolysis we're breaking down that glycogen into glucose so that we can create energy 
This is for moderate to high intensity exercise. So exercise anywhere from about 10 seconds to about two minutes. Okay, that's the available time frame that we can use this system. Now lactic acid, I know a lot of people have heard of lactic acid. This is how lactic acid is formed. It's when break, we have the breakdown of glucose without oxygen. Okay, so lactic acid is a byproduct of this anaerobic glycolysis. And most people that have felt lactic acid have felt, yes, kind of like a deep burning. Well, when we have that lactic acid production, it comes along with a bunch of hydrogen ions. And that lowers the pH, which creates for more of an acidic environment. And that's what leads to the burning sensation. So we have a lot, a lot of free-flowing acid, uh, which is in the form of the hydrogen ions, and then we feel the burning in our muscles, okay? That's a product of this system. So some examples of this are yoga, HIIT training, and submaximal strength training, okay? And this is a snapshot of what the anaerobic glycolysis or the lactic acid system looks like. So let's move along and talk about the slowest production, which is our aerobic system. <clears throat> and most people are somewhat familiar with this. So this is what happens when we do have oxygen available to burn carbohydrates and fats. So let's take a second to talk about this. When we breathe in oxygen, when we breathe in air, we're breathing in oxygen. From there, the oxygen, it meets a bunch of blood vessels deep in our lungs. That will, uh, there will be a, a gas exchange there where our blood will actually pull the oxygen out of our lungs. Then it will transport it throughout our body to the muscles that need the oxygen. When the aerobic system is going, our breath rate can keep up with the amount of uh, oxygen that we need to deliver to the muscles, okay? So for that reason, it's longer duration, but it's usually generally, uh, generally lower in terms of intensity because our breath rate can keep up with the oxygen delivery. This is where we have mitochondria producing ATP in the body, okay? And I like to put this in there because I'm 31 years old, and one of the things that sticks out about high school biology is mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And this is why, because it continuously churns out ATP. It's something that, you know, is, it's the powerhouse of the cell because it keeps pumping out energy. It's a slow rate, but that's what it does. It's very effective at producing ATP, but once again, it is a slow rate. So examples of this aerobic system are jogging, biking, and swimming, okay? Uh, so again, this is something most people are familiar with. Those are the three systems. So let's see if you're paying attention. We have the three energy systems, the fast production, the medium production, and the slow production, okay? So as you're watching this, I want you to ask yourself, which energy system are we most likely using for the following? So first example, a 60 minute bike ride. That would be our slow or our aerobic system, mostly because of the duration, 60 minutes. Next, lifting a heavy couch so your wife can retrieve your stuck room of vacuum. Happens a lot in my household. That's our fast production of energy, our phosphogen system. It's a heavy couch, we're just lifting it once. A 200 meter sprint, and we'll say that takes you about 35 seconds. That would be your medium or your anaerobic glycolysis. A 40 yard dash, say you're five, that takes you about five seconds, um, unless you're Tom Brady. That would be the phosphogen system, okay? That's the fast production of energy. So hopefully you're getting this. Jump and rope for 30 seconds, right? That's our medium or our anaerobic glycolysis, okay? And then pickleball. Pickleball. So I threw this in there on purpose. So pickleball is something that can dip into multiple energy sources. We might be using that slow system as we're awaiting a serve and as our partner's hitting the ball. We might move into the anaerobic glycolysis as we're running a little bit more, and we might even dip into the fast or the phosphogen system. So the reason I put that example in there is because these don't always exist in isolation. We might be using multiple systems. So now take a second, look at your goals, and think to yourself, which systems most likely need to be trained based on the goals that I've written down? Is it the fast, the medium, or the slow? And as you think about that, I'm gonna grab a sip of water. Okay, so keep thinking about that throughout this presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments because I'm sure other people have the same questions. So now it's time to train. We know the systems that we need to train, but how? I haven't taught you how to do that yet. 
So let's take a second to talk about that. First, I do want to talk about a concept called sports-specific training. Now, sports-specific training I have in quotations because I think it means different things to different people. I define sports-specific training as training should match the movements in a chosen activity. Okay, so let's give some examples about that. Tennis. So tennis has a lot of rotation. It has a lot of side-to-side running. It has a lot of lunging as we're going for the ball. Golf. Golf has a lot of hip rotation. It has a lot of thoracic or mid-spine rotation. And we might be standing on uneven surfaces. And then there's even an example of playing with a grandchild where we're going to be getting onto the floor, getting up, or bending over. Okay, so in my mind, sports-specific training, takes us, uh, we should take a step back and look at our goals. Are we, do we want to play tennis? Do we want to play golf? Are we looking to play with our grandchildren? And how can we train so our activities match the sport? All right, so let's look at a couple examples. If I walk through a gym, these are things that I see all the time. And my question is always, what's the purpose of doing them? Is this a sport specific movement? So first example, bench press. Okay, great exercise. A lot of people like to do it. What is that training for? Bicep curls. Okay, if we take our golf example, if we, uh, if we hit a hole in one and we wanna work on our Tiger Woods fist pump, our biceps might be looking nice, but how is that actually gonna help us swing a golf club? Things like a leg extension machine. Sure, they might target the muscles that we're looking to hit, but is it really going to help us perform a sport or an activity? So for sport specific movements, this is a couple examples of things that I like to do. And both of these are going to relate to golf. The first one, we're going to look at my golf swing and I want to work on my hip rotation. This is what it looks like when I hit a golf ball. And then, so I want to put a medicine ball on my hand and match that specific movement. I'm getting my hips through as if I had a golf club in my hand. Okay. The next, the next example is an example of one of my clients who's missing some mid-spine or thoracic rotation. Take a look at his golf swing. Okay, so trunk doesn't move too well, but what we can do is put a resistance band in his hand and we can perform that exact movement at the speed of sport, the speed that we're looking for him to move. Right technical difficulties. Okay, so let's take a second to think back to ancient societies. Okay, they understood exercise capacity, whether or not they called it that, but it's the amount of physical exertion required to complete a task. So when we train, we have to think, what is the task at hand? What is it that I'm looking to get better at? Is it a sport or is is it just an activity of daily life? And how can we build the exercise capacity to complete the task? How can I get myself so that I am at my minimum buy-in so I can even do the task in general? I put these puzzle pieces there because the training should match the activity, okay? So what does training look like when we're looking at each specific system? Let's first talk about the phosphagen system, and that's that fast production of energy. First off, sports-specific movements for all the reasons we just talked about. Next, we wanna have exercise that lasts eight to 10 seconds because that's how long we can use this system for. Our rest period should be two to five minutes, okay? And for those of you who are really paying attention, I said before that the rest periods for us to recover this system would be three to five minutes. That's true. But sometimes we don't have that full three to five minute window to rest. And a good example would be a a striker or a forward in soccer or football to my European friends. So with football, think about Lionel Messi. You know, he might be taking a run at the goal and then, you know, the ball gets cleared, but then another two minutes later, he has to make that same run at the goal. He's not going to sit there and look at his watch and say, that hasn't been the full three minutes yet. I can't do it. We might be sometimes working on a partially recovered system. And that's fine. All that that means is that we might not have that full eight to 10 seconds to use. Sometimes it might look like four or five, six seconds. Okay. So we can exercise in a partially recovered system. This is for explosive and short duration movements, things like jumping, sprinting, and lifting. Okay. So if I were to actually train somebody, these are some of the things I like to utilize. These are some of the training methods I like. This would be in the form of medicine balls, resistance bands, weights, and body weight movements. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about anaerobic glycolysis, all right? 
So what does training look like? Once again, sports specific movements. Can we match what we're looking to do out there on the tennis court, on the track, with the grandchildren, etc.? This is exercise lasting 10 seconds to two minutes because that's how long we get to use this system for. The rest periods look very similar, 10 seconds to two minutes, okay? Um, and that's where we'll have our system recover. This is sustained high intensity exercise, things like HIIT training, and we want to get to that point that we feel the burning, which is that lactic acid production. That's how we know we're utilizing this system. So what does it look like? Uh, what are some training methods? So circuit training is one, resistance bands, timed exercise. So rather than just counting repetitions, can we put a clock to it to make sure that we're utilizing that 10 second to two minute window? Lower rate weight in terms of the amount of resistance and higher repetitions. So we're in that 10 to two minute range. Okay, and then the aerobic system, all right? So sports specific movements. If we're swimming, uh, if, if we have a swimming competition, are we really gonna cycle uh, to get ready for that? This is longer lasting bouts of exercise, two minutes and above. We have longer duration. It's typically conversational, meaning as I'm doing, as I'm biking, for example, I could talk to someone next to me without feeling like I'm gonna pass out. It's lower intensity in nature and rest periods are not needed because you've got that mitochondria that are just churning out ATP. So what does training look like? These are different training methods, things like walking, jogging, swimming, biking, using an elliptical. And one thing I think people are not using enough, it's mobility training, just getting the body moving in, in certain fashions. All right, so we understand how to use each system. We understand what each system is. Now, let's take a second to talk about how each system responds to training. So essentially, our systems will respond to training. And a better way of saying that is we get in shape. Go figure. So the phosphogen or the creatine system, we have the increased ability to store creatine phosphate. In parentheses, I put supplementation. I said I'd talk about this. Creatine is something that can be a useful supplement uh, to use to help build this phosphogen or the creatine phosphate system. So this is for short term uh, and, and explosive movements, which doesn't always pertain to everybody. So if we're training for a marathon, creatine might not necessarily help us because it's a different system of the body. Regardless, when we train, we will increase the storage capacity. We'll also have improved efficiency of the system, which just means that our body can tap into this creatine phosphate a little bit easier. And as we train, we might start at the 10 sec, or I'm sorry, the eight second window. And once we get more trained, we get about 10 seconds of use. Now the anaerobic glycolysis or the lactic acid system, when we train, we have increased turnover of lactic acid to reusable energy. So if you're beginning exercise and you're starting to, to utilize that lactic acid system, you might start to feel like, man, I've got this burn and it's really limiting what I can do with my workouts. The more that we work out, the more we can actually take that lactic acid and use it for reusable energy, okay? It is something that can be reused for energy, but we have to learn, our body has to learn how to do that. And that's not an overnight thing. Um, so that's when we start exercise again, that, that burning is really limiting to us and we might even feel it after the exercise, but the more quote unquote in shape we get, uh, the, the less we feel that. We also get improved blood flow, which helps clear the lactic acid. So a take home with this is that lactic acid is usually the limiting factor when it comes to utilizing the anaerobic glycolysis system. And then the aerobic training, well, we get improved efficiency of energy production, things like breaking down carbohydrates and fats. We also get with improved blood flow to the areas, we get improved oxygen delivery to the muscles. All right, Sean, I, I've listened to what it looks like when it gets in shape. I know what the systems mean, but how will I know I've used the right system? Say I've just done a workout. How will I know that I've, again, I've tapped into the right systems? So what to expect after exercise? We use the body's phosphogen system. Um, we will have muscle damage in the form of delayed onset muscle soreness. Okay, so if you, feel, if you felt this before, it's usually peaks around two to three days post-exercise. And uh, this is a little different than our body's lactic acid production because lactic acid will feel right then and there as we're working out. This muscle damage tends to come a little bit later, uh, two to three days afterwards, 
and I'll explain to you the muscle damage a little bit later in this presentation. But regardless, that's how we know we've used that phosphagen system. We've actually created a little bit of damage to the muscles. For anaerobic glycolysis, we'll have that accumulation of, of lactic acid. So during the exercise, we'll feel the muscle soreness. That's how we know we're using this system. And finally, with the aerobic training, we'll have a depletion of glycogen stores, which means that we just start to get a general feeling of fatigue and malaise because the amount of glucose that we have and glycogen uh, that we have available is depleting. And uh, that's something that after the, the workouts, we just feel general, uh, generally exhausted. Like, whew, I worked out pretty hard. Okay, and now one key to keep in mind for recovery is cross-training. And cross-training might look like different things for different people. There's cross-training shoes. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. There's CrossFit, also nothing to do with what we're talking about. So cross-training, I define it, uh, well, we need rest. The body needs rest to make sure that it... Um, it can help recover uh, appropriately. If we don't rest, we get something called central nervous system fatigue, okay? All that this means is our brain sends signals down our spinal cord out to the muscles, okay? The more that we utilize that system, that system itself can actually go through fatigue. And that doesn't mean that during an exercise we're gonna get central nervous system fatigue. That means that over weeks, months, even years, if we continue to use the same systems over and over and over again, the systems themselves will fatigue out and get tired. So we need to make sure that we're appropriately dosing things. So taxing different systems uh, in order to recover our primary energy system is how I will define cross-training. Essentially, we wanna use the phosphagen system, anaerobic or aerobic, uh, just to, to tax different systems of our body. So recovering of our energy systems, the primary energy system we're looking to train, is one way to help avoid injuries, specifically overuse injuries. So this is where science can help develop a little bit of the art of training. And my art, this is what it looks like. I like to train my system two to four times per week. Right now, I'm heavy on training my anaerobic glycolysis system. So what I like to do is train that system two to four times a week, and I like to cross train at least one time a week. That way I'm letting my anaerobic glycolysis system recover. So cross training examples, we just wanna utilize different energy systems to allow our primary energy system to recover. These are the different training methods that I like. We've talked about these in, in prior slides, um, but these are different exercise methods that we can use to help, say if we're training our phosphagen system, these are different ways of training the anaerobic glycolysis or the aerobic glycolysis system, okay? So just if different ways of, of, uh, of taxing different systems. So how do I build a basic workout structure? And once again, this is more of an art slide than it is a science slide, so I'll give you my opinion. We do wanna, first of all, create workouts around our goals. In an ideal world, we'll have one system that we work out per workout, okay? So the phosphagen, the creatine, uh, I'm sorry, the phosphagen, the anaerobic glycolysis, or the aerobic system. Now, that doesn't always happen because we might only have two or three days to work out in a week because we're busy people. So if we can't work out consistently, then we'll have to tap into other energy systems. For example, we might be working that phosphagen system primarily. 30 to 40 minutes of our workout is that. But then we'll add another 15 to 30 minutes of anaerobic glycolysis. So this is where you have to try to be a little creative with your workouts. When I say ideal, when I'm working with my pro athletes, they'll be able to work out their one system per workout because that's their job. For those of us that have other jobs, we might have to dip into that second little category below um, and work out different systems within the same workout period. Okay, let's take a breath. I'm gonna grab a sip of water. Love it. So let's talk about some commonly or some common underlying exercise goals. Now, this is something that when I've given this presentation in the past and when I've talked to my clients when I see them, there are underlying exercise goals that they'll give me as their primary exercise goals. I don't think they should be the primary exercise goal because we're not really trying to accomplish uh, much aside from aesthetics, really. But these are fat burning strength building, and then hypertrophy, which is increasing the size of the muscle. Because these are asked so much, I do wanna talk about them and how, to, how we can achieve them. However, I will put a big asterisk on all these sections because once again, I don't think these should be our primary exercise goal. 
So the first one, fat burning, this is also known as lipolysis. <clears throat> this is the exercise science behind lipolysis. So lipolysis breaks down adipose tissue. <clears throat> Let's take a second to talk about that slide. So adipose tissue, that's our body's body fat. Okay, that's stored fat in our body. Uh, we already mentioned before that lysis, that, that suffix is breaking something down, lysis. Lip, lipo, that refers to lipids. And lipids, if we think about uh, one of the, the fats that, that is more well known to people are oils. And if you combine oil and water, those two don't, don't mix well. Uh, and that's because of something called a lipid layer. And that surrounds the whole area of, in this case, the adipose tissue, where it's not hydro, it, it doesn't mix with water. Um, so that lipid, uh, that lipid layer, we have to break open to, to get all the, um, they're called triglycerides, out of our adipose tissue so we can use that as energy. Okay, so lipolysis, that's what we're doing here. We're breaking down the fat cells. This is best done with low to moderate exercise, which is in that aerobic category. Now, lipolysis requires energy. It's an energy demanding process, meaning that the energy required to do lipolysis is up here. So our energy with exercise has to stay down here relatively. As the intensity of our exercise increases, our ability to burn fat decreases. So with the increase in intensity of exercise, we use something that's more readily available, and that's carbohydrates, that's glucose. We can get more efficient at lipolysis throughout exercise, so some of those, so those levels, we can get more efficient at burning fats. There are other factors when it comes to burning fat, which is stress, diet, hormone levels, and heat and cold exposure, which we won't have time to cover in this presentation, but there's plenty of information of that out there. Understand that all exercise ultimately helps the body learn to break down fats, okay? But in terms of exercise science, this is typically the best way to do things. So things aren't always clear if I just talk about them. <clears throat> so let's bring up a prior slide. The spectrum of energy demands with exercise. We're in that aerobic category, which is on the far left, okay? Specifically, we have fat burning. And as the intensity of exercise increases, we can no longer burn fat because rem remember, lipolysis requires a lot of energy. So we start burning carbohydrates. Um, there is a line of demarcation in there, okay? And now this has been studied quite a bit. There's a lot of research around it. And that line typically happens at about 140 beats per minute. So if we're working out and we have a heart rate monitor, whether that's an actual monitor or a watch, we can start to keep track of when our body goes from burning fats to burning carbohydrates. Now that 140, that's gonna be different in everybody, um, but relatively speaking, maybe the difference of 10 uh, beats per minute, plus or minus. But that's a good kind of rule of thumb to keep in mind that 140 beats per minute, anything above that, we're probably gonna start to burn carbohydrates, okay? So if our goal is burning fats, we wanna stay below that. And continuing on with this spectrum, we continue to burn carbohydrates with anaerobic glycolysis and then way in that phosphogen, uh, that eight to 10 second window, we're just burning creatine phosphate. All right, so that's what it looks like burning fat. Now, strength building. This is some brief exercise science behind strength drill, uh, building. So over time, the efficiency of our muscle contractions improve, especially as we are just starting out a strength building program. This is in the form of motor unit activation. So that's the nerves that supply the muscles, okay? We get the signals from our brain down our spinal cord out to the muscles. That is our motor unit. We also get improved efficiency of signaling from the brain, which once again is the nervous system. We also get better at muscle fiber recruitment in terms of the amount of muscle fibers. So imagine I'm doing a bicep curl. As I first start working out, I actually am not going to be able to utilize all of my muscle fibers. But the more that I do this, these exercises and work out, I will get more efficient at, at recruiting and utilizing all of those muscle fibers. Okay, we're also going to have connective tissue strengthening, so in the form of ligaments, tendons, and fascia of the body. And we also improve the efficiency of the phosphogen system for reasons that we went over before. Okay, so this picture I put in there because we actually get better at the brain to body connection, okay? That's what's happening for the most part as we initiate a strength building routine. Okay, so more of the exercise science behind it. Most changes are neurological for all the reasons we've listed in the prior slide. 
Now, progressive overload is something that we need to utilize. And that just means that we're increasing the load over time. And that load can be in increasing re uh, resistance, but also repetitions. Uh, from a sports science standpoint, these repetitions are typically in the lower range, okay? Uh, less than or equal to six is ideal for a strength building program. And the resistance is typically 85% or less of, or I'm sorry, 85% or more than your one repetition max. So say I'm a strong dude, say my one repetition max for bicep curl, my amount that I can only do one with clean form is 10 pounds, okay? If I wanna truly do a strength building program for my bicep curls, I'm gonna to have to be at at least eight and a half pounds and do repetitions for six reps or less. And my rest periods is one to three minutes. I also think this is an underutilized part of workouts is timing the rest periods because that way we're gonna get the most out of our workouts. And on the picture that's right above me, the progressive overload, this is just what it looks like. We have load, over time our body adapts to the load. So we have to increase the load as it adapts again, we increase, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so this is uh, now muscle hypertrophy, which is increasing the size, okay? Trophic factors, trophy, that, that uh, refers to the body's cells, and hyper is to increase the size of. This often parallels strength gains, okay? But not always. This, uh, the physiology of what's going on is we're causing micro tears in the muscle, and those will heal larger back from where they were before. The repetition ranges here are typically higher than they are in strength training. So now we're looking at six to 12 repetitions and the resistance is about 67 to 85%. So say we take that same bicep curl example where the one RM is 10 pounds. So I'll need 6.7 to 8.5 pounds to have an appropriate load to help uh, build my muscle size. And the rest periods here are shorter than strength training, which is about 30 to 90 seconds, okay? This is the, what science gives us in terms of what the most efficient way to do this is. Now, eccentric focused exercises promote muscle damage at a greater rate than concentric. Let's talk about that for a second. So if I'm doing a bicep curl, if I bring point A and B closer together, that's called concentric. If I hold the weight out in front of me and I'm, I have a load through my bicep, that's called isometric, where there's a load, but it's not moving. And then if I'm lowering, that's called eccentric. I also call it strengthening through lengthening. Um, some of the more bro science is called negatives, but either way, that's gonna cause more damage at a greater rate to help promote uh, the muscle hypertrophy. So hypertrophy training, eccentric exercises are important. Understand that hypertrophy may be counterintuitive to sports training. And I'll point to some of the better football players out there nowadays. Um, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes. You know, these guys don't look like bodybuilders, but they're the best in their sport at what they're doing. So you have to understand that they're training more sports-specific movements than they are traditional bodybuilding-type movements. Okay. So with hypertrophy, is there a limit? Say, for whatever reason, you do wanna put on muscle size. There is a limit to how large we can get, and that's in the form of something called myostatin. Myostatin exists in everybody, um, and there's it's just basically the limit. So myo is muscle, statin is to stop, or stasis. Now this is a classic example. These are uh, uh, Belgian blue bulls that have something called myostatin inhibitors which just means that they uh, that myostatin that would normally exist in these bulls isn't there. So these, these bulls can basically get as large as, as physically possible. And these bulls are just kind of grazing out in the field all day. It's not like they're doing bench press and squats, but it's because of that unregulated growth of muscle that they look like that. So where do these changes occur when we're talking about strength training and we're talking about hypertrophy? This uh, graphic I really like. I think it's a good depiction of what's going on. So we talked about before, our nervous system adapts first. If we take, it the, or if we take a look at the first two lines, uh, the ones that go up concurrently, if you follow the first one all the way up to the top, that's our strength. And right alongside of it is our neural adaptation. So basically our nervous system adapts first. That's what's giving us a lot of the strength. You'll notice that the third line that starts is hypertrophy, the growth of the muscles. Okay, this usually starts to occur about six weeks into a strength training program or, an, or a hypertrophy program. 
Okay, so if we're working out and we don't happen to notice that our muscles are getting any larger, it's because those nervous system adaptations are happening first, and then we're gonna get to the hypertrophy at about six weeks, okay? And then we'll notice that all of these peak off at a certain time. And this is all relative. That, that time frame is a relatively long time. But we will see that peak, and for the most part, that's our body's myostatin, saying, hey, enough is enough. And at the very end, you see the dotted line, and that's if we have anabolic steroid use. For various reasons, I don't recommend it. Okay, so we understand the way the body works a little bit more now. And now let's, let's circle back to the goals that we have written down. So I wanna talk about making the most out of our goals. Okay, what I like are SMART goals. And now SMART is an acronym. SMART stands for specific. So in our case, are things sports specific? Measurable, okay, what's the distance of race? Or if I'm looking to climb a flight of stairs, how many stairs are in the staircase? Are they attainable? Can you realistically run a marathon? Is that a good goal for you? Are they relevant? If you wanna bike a century, which is 100 miles, do you even like to bike, right? And are they timely? What's the time frame that we would like to complete these goals by? So let's see if we can utilize this information. Do we have SMART goals written down? Based on our SMART goals, which systems do we need to train between the phosphagen system, the anaerobic glycolysis, the aerobic system? What is the exercise capacity, which is also what is my minimum buy-in to be able to do the movements? Will we cross train to help our body recover? In summary, our workforce has created a relatively sedentary society. There's numerous benefits of exercise, which shouldn't be a review to anybody, but we do have body's energy systems that we need to utilize between the phosphagen, the anaerobic glycolysis, and the aerobic system. If we utilize SMART goals and choose based or exercises based on our body's demands, we can be successful when it comes to working out. Thank you all for your attention, and I hope you were able to learn a couple things. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot me a message or add a comment. And if you have ideas for future presentations, I'd love to hear them. So thanks again for your attention, everybody, and I hope to see you again soon in a new video.